So, hey there, welcome back. If you've been here um, today or continued on for the previous talks, welcome to the DevSecOps track here at OWAS AppSec EU. Uh, my name is Nathan Britton. I'm an OWAS volunteer. I'm an OWAS chapter leader here in the UK for the Birmingham uh, West Midlands chapter. And I'm going to be your moderator for today's session. Today's session is all about mastering one of OWAS flagship projects, Defect Dojo. So during the next 45 minutes, you're going to be listening to Cody Mafucci, and he's going to present his talk called Becoming a Master in the Dojang with De Defect Dojo. Um, looking to be about 45 minutes, and then we'll have 10 minutes for 10 minutes or so for Q&A. So please submit any questions you have uh, in the Q&A session, uh, the section of the Woover app or the Woover, uh, mobile app or the browser. And I'll ask Cody at the end of the of his talk. Um, okay, so that's more than enough from me. Uh, let's get straight into it. Let's introduce Cody. And uh, over to you, Cody. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you, Nathan. Hey. Can my screen be seen okay? Looks good. Good deal. Okay. Uh, so once again, uh, hello, everybody. My name is Cody Mafucci. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Nathan. Uh, you encapsulated it perfectly. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about becoming a master in the Dojang with Defect Dojo. What are the best places to really show, show your guns within the Dojo and becoming that karate master? Um, so first off, a little bit about myself, um, Cody Mafucci. <laughs> um, so why am I here? Uh, how did I get here? Um, so I'm a Defect Dojo core contributor and moderator. Uh, I got in introduced to the projects uh, at the end of 2018. So I've been around for a little bit. Um, and a lot of my responsibilities include just reviewing pull requests, helping community members, making contributions to make Defect Dojo better, um, and just generally just keeping the project alive among my peers and colleagues. Um, in addition to that, uh, my day jobs are a co-founder at 10 Security, where I mainly serve as product architecture, creating new products. Um, and then my main job is the TIPCO software as a senior security engineer, where we've successfully deployed Defect Dojo into our apps like pipelines and have seen terrific results. Um, so let's get into it. What, what is Defect Dojo? Um, it's in intentionally intended to be kind of the, the brains of your whole security application pipeline. Uh, we dub it the, the vulnerability management platform that has security orchestration, supposed to be kind of the, the central information hub of truths and knowledge. Um, in my experience, I've seen a lot of security tools have their own kind of uh, platform for how they, they display all the information that they collect. And, you know, every single one has their own different hub. And it's very challenging to kind of keep all of that information just in, in either in your head or uh, recorded somewhere where it all kind of makes sense. Um, but, but generally tends to end you up at like an Excel spreadsheet, which isn't ideal, right? Um, so under Defect Dojo, it's intended to be sort of a, a one-stop shop for all security folks and developers, um, whether you want to be working together in the same platform or have it spread out ac across a different, uh, a handful of different platforms. Either way works, um, but to make that happen, you need to have an easy, an easy integration through APIs, um, but you got to have good documentation to make sure it's actually usable too. Um, so there's other tools out there that do similar things, but what makes Defect Dojo so special? Um, the greatest part about it is that it's totally free. Um, so as Nathan mentioned, it is an OWASP flagship project, so it's open source, it's community maintained. Um, but I think the, the most special thing about it is that we have a very fast release cycle. So if you run into a, a, break, a breaking bug that tends to break your pipelines, or maybe you don't have, uh, you're using a security tool that Defect Dojo doesn't offer, you can create your personal and, and a custom solution that is generally made available to the public and it comes out within a month. Um, so with most enterprise software, it takes a good quarter, sometimes two quarters to get features or maybe some, some really uh, interesting functionality that you need out of the tool. But that's not really an issue with Defect Dojo. Um, in terms of support, Defect Dojo's got it all. We've got dynamic scanning, static scanning, software composition analysis. Uh, there's probably a lot of other acronyms out there that I'm not totally familiar with, um, including infrastructure scanning, such so like NASA's and Qualys and Docker scanning like SNCC. Um, and a ton more. So we've got you covered in all areas where you would need it. Uh, here's a, a quick sampling of some of those tools. Uh, I went through and counted on this slide. There's only 23 displayed here. 
Um, but Defect Dojo offers right under 150 scan types. Um, you know, if I try to display the logo of all of them, I need a lot more slides. Um, so I had to keep it brief. Um, but just looking at a few of these, you know, you've got your dynamic scanning and burp. Uh, web application was, was Qualys. Uh, got the Docker scanning and SNCC, uh, static and check marks. Got a whole bunch of different flavors and ways to, to make sure that you're protected in the, in the right places. Um, so, you know, 150 tools, that sounds kind of overwhelming. You know, I don't want to turn you into, into that guy on the slide, just kind of blank and blah. Um, so in a way to try to simplify it, um, we, we tried to rack our brains and figure out what's the easiest way we could go from security tool to defect dojo. And what we found is kind of the most universal method is to just download the scan reports from the tool, upload the defect dojo, and then we've got magic happening basically. Um, but it's really no use if you have to do everything by hand. And so everything of what, uh, what I'm covering today and many more was in Defect Dojo has an API endpoint as well. So everything in Defect Dojo can be automated through the API, which is a huge plus point. Um, but you know, I mentioned previously, maybe you're using a security tool that Defect Dojo doesn't have support for. Um, so in response to that, we've got two different generic formats, uh, CSV and JSON. Uh, it's, it's essentially plug and play. Um, all, all of the fields within those two generic formats are mapped directly to uh, a finding, just kind of like a vulnerability in Defect Dojo, um, but to the finding fields such that you can input in, you know, maybe the, the URL it was found on and a little description about what the issue is, maybe a CVSS score, um, but it's, it, it's pretty encompassing. Um, and you know, you may run into a situation where maybe you only have to report one single thing. You know, maybe you you stumbled upon some leak credentials or something. So instead of uh, creating a, a generic format CSV or JSON file, you can just manually step through the process of each field and in the, in the vulnerability finding and just kind of create it ad hoc on the fly. Um, let's talk about getting started. In Defect Dojo, what are the best ways to deploy? Um, there's four, four uh, ways to deploy Defect Dojo, three of which are supported. I'll get into that a little further down. Um, but I've labeled them as the easy breezy and for the brave, based on how, how my experience has been with deploying with these technologies. Um, I found that Docker Compose is 100% the easiest. It's the tried and true. We've used it since 2019, so we've got a lot of experience around it. Um, it's the, the main main vehicle for development in Defect Dojo. So anything that we're developing is going to be directly on the uh, in a production environment if using Docker Compose, and it's going to have the best compatibility there. Um, it's very configurable, and Docker Compose mainly works by shoving variables into uh, into the environment, and then it kind of disperses them into the correct Docker containers. Um, so it's you can configure a lot with it. Um, but there is kind of a learning curve to Docker Compose. So in response to that, we've got uh, a small library of helper scripts that kind of get you started and get you going. Um, that way you don't have to learn everything about Docker Compose to really get up and going in Defect Dojo. Uh, followed by that, we have the AMI, stands for Amazon Marketplace Image. Uh, it's kind of a, a point and click, very easy to walk through. Uh, it's got information including you know, what, what host you want to uh, have your Defect Dojo instance served on, generates a TLS cert for you, um, and it has a lot of uh, extra protections through uh, Amazon DC2 instances and within the Dojo configuration itself to make it ready for production use kind of right at launch. Um, so it's, it's kind of a one-stop shop if you're trying to get up quickly and don't really want to have to learn all about the project. Um, but the, the silver lining on that one is that it does support the project. So all the proceeds go directly back into the project to keep it alive and keep it maintained and everything like that. So super awesome there. Um, our other two deployment methods, we've got GoDojo. Um, this was uh, kind of a, a second iteration of our original setup.bash script. Uh, it's a graduation from just a bash script to a binary, like an executable of sorts. Um, it's intended to be run just on a straight virtual machine such that you don't have to install Docker, you don't have to install uh, Helm or Kubernetes or anything. It's just you run it and it takes care of all the rest and installs everything you need and nothing else. Um, it's also very configurable such that Docker composes, um, but there's a little bit of a learning curve too because there's just so much configuration. Um, and the last one I have for you is Kubernetes. Uh, I dubbed this the Ravager mainly because anytime I try it, I, I have a really hard time being successful. But I'm not very familiar with uh, K8s or Kubernetes at all. I try to keep it that way, honestly. Um, but it is very, very powerful. It's 
equally complex, honestly, um, but it is probably one of the best, uh, best, best deployments for a high availability server. Um, I mentioned that this is the one deployment method that's not 100% supported. It's kind of community maintained. We've got two moderators that are uh, the Kubernetes aficionados that really keep it alive, um, but they do an excellent job of doing so. And they're very quick with debugging information if anyone should need some help. Um, so let's talk about, you know, once you get your defect dojo instance going, what do you do with it? Where do you put it? Um, so this is a, a common model that I think a lot of a lot of companies are moving to sort of like an event driven pipeline. Um, we're starting off on the left here where maybe a, a developer pushes to a specific branch um, and there's automation around that specific event that will launch a whole slew of activities. So in this model, it's taking Docker and launching up a handful of tools. Looks like we got zap check marks and app splider. Uh, launching Dockerized versions of those security tools and scanning the application, probably static analysis would be the easy bet here, you know, Zaps dynamic, but uh, anyways, once it gets those results, pushes them up to Defect Dojo, Defect Dojo does all its magic, and then it starts dispersing the results either into Slack in the form of a notification, alerting your, um, your security engineers like, hey, you've got some work to do or it'll take the vulnerabilities himself and push them into a place that developers like to work, like Jira. Um, that way there's not a lot of hands-off uh, and transfer knowledge. It's all just kind of done automatically. It's, it's really neat. Um, so I actually have a super rough and dirty example of this pipeline. Um, if you scan that QR code, it'll take you to a repo and the Defect Dojo organization. Um, I used this demo in a previous talk and it does basically that, but I'll walk through uh, exactly what's happening. Um, so I mentioned it was quick and dirty. This one actually spins up a Defect Dojo instance out of a Docker container, and it actually does get blown away. So this is not intended to be used in production, but it's a, a really good way to get you started and get familiar with kind of the, the pipeline aspect of things. Um, and in addition to spinning up a Defect Dojo instance, we're also spinning up our application. Uh, I used JuShop because I was pretty confident I could get some kind of results out of it. Um, and so once, once I have my two prerequisites up and running. Uh, I start spinning up those, those security tools, um, start attacking the application. Um, but the trick here is that if you don't save those scan reports into kind of uh, an omnipresent volume or something like that and just leave them in the container, they're going to get blown away with the container. So it's very important to move those to a more persistent location, such as in like a Docker volume. Um, and I've got the, the directory structure on the next slide of what that looks like. Uh, so going over the directory structure in the top right corner, um, I've organized it kind of in kind of like a, a queue of sorts. Everything that's going to be coming out of a security tool will go into the to-do folder, and you'll just have, you know, each folder would be labeled as something like, you know, this is the tool it came from, zap scan, SSLI scan, uh, and here are all the, all the reports that haven't been processed yet. And so down at the bottom in that custom container, I have a script that runs that crawls through the directory and takes each one of those unprocessed scans, pushes them up to Defect Dojo. And then depending on the status code, Defect Dojo will return back to me. I'll either put the report in the completed or failed directory, um, whatever happens, just so I could go back later and see, okay, why did this fail? Uh, and try to debug it from there. Or maybe if it's completed, I'll just blow it away and kind of forget about it. Or, you know, compliance may make me keep it for a set amount of time. Um, so once that's all finished, um, super important to clean up all of your work you know, leaving resources kind of orphaned can be expensive and it's just not good housekeeping. Um, so I did mention at the beginning that, um, the demo, uh, in that repo does spin up a, a defect dojo instance in a container. Um, but my graph doesn't represent that. So this is an ideal world where your defect dojo instance will just be persistent and ever living and all your data will live there. It won't be blown away in a container. This is what you wanna shoot for. Okay, so let's get into more about defect dojo and the cool features that it has and really how to master it. Um, so anytime that I'm evaluating an application for either use or if you're testing it, whatever the case may be, I kind of go through a four step program. And you think about what, what are the main features of the product? Why, why am I using it? Why am I, uh, how is it going to help me? Um, so today I've got going over the models and the terminology, how to really uh, piece everything together using the nomenclature, uh, talk about import and re-import, the differences between the two, what's special about them and when to use them or not to use them possibly. 
uh, followed by the duplication, which is kind of the where the smartness comes from Defect Dojo in terms of well, deduplicating, uh, removing duplicates and identifying them. Um, and then sort of our new first class citizen and dojo tags and services, how they help, uh, they're kind of worth their weight in gold. Um, so after I get through all the features, we're going to talk about you know, what, what can the application do and not do? Is there a lot of uh, area between permission models? You know, is there uh, a reason why I should stay away from some and maybe other, uh, other pieces of the model are not so useful to, to the application side of it? Um, and once you figure that out, you know, the tool is great and all. If, if it's very hands-on, maybe it's not as great as it could be. So is it really easy to integrate into my other tools to kind of make everything seamless? Um, so I've got a Jira integration to walk you through and then some extra features that have been added to the API over the years to make things a little more human. It's pretty cool. Um, and then lastly, you know, the, an application is only as strong as the resources around it. You know, if you've ever run into an application that has no resources, you know, it's a very uphill battle and honestly a pretty big deterrent. Um, so let's get into it. So model structure, um, let's all pretend we work at Google and we're on the AppSec program there and we need to make sure all of Google's products are protected. So at, at the top of the umbrella in Defect Dojo, we have something called a product type. Think of this as like a D Suite as a whole. You know, what, what are all the products within G Suite that they offer? You've got things like Google Docs, Google Sheets, Google Slides, Gmail, um, Google Meets. You've got a bunch of different ones. Um, so product is kind of just what the application is that needs to be tested. Um, so these tests, you know, they occur either yearly or quarterly or daily. You may have um, your event-driven testing as well. But an engagement is to be thought of as like a point in time. Um, and at that point in time, you're probably going to be testing with a whole suite of tools uh, to make sure that all your bases are covered. Um, and so that's sort of what a test represents is whatever the security tool is, whether it be Burp Suite or SonarQ or SNCC or anything like that. All of those tools are kind of gathered into an engagement to show, you know, this is what I've done on this application at this point in time. Um, and so discovered by a test, you've got your findings. This is the real vulnerability data that a security tool would produce. Um, it's kind of just a very large model in our case with a whole bunch of extra metadata field to try to uh, build as many relationships across other findings and do things smartly. Um, and lastly, we've got endpoints. Um, they're really only applicable to um, dynamic scanners. That's essentially where was the vulnerability found? Um, probably wondering, okay, that's great if I'm using a dynamic scanner, but what if I only do static analysis? Um, the endpoint is not really used in those cases, but there is a lot of uh, fields within the finding model, such as like you know, line number, file path, um, that you could shove data into to still identify the location of where vulnerability could be found, but it just isn't in another model, which has its benefits and sometimes. Uh, okay, so getting into how data gets imported into Defect Dojo. We've got two different endpoints here, import and re-import. They sound super similar, but they actually behave super differently. Um, so with import, it's sort of kind of, uh, sort of kind of, it, it's, it's a big picture view. It's kind of like a single point in time visualization of everything that's happening in the application at one point in time. So, you know, for example, if you scan something and imported all the results in say January and then came back in February and did the same thing, you may see a lot of the same vulnerability data from uh, one month to another in case something didn't get fixed, or maybe there was a, a reintroduction or regression or something like that. Um, so it, it's a very verbose way to figure out exactly where all the security issues are in your given application, but this could lead to vulnerability overload. You know, if you're testing every month and you've got Defect Dojo for two years, that could be a lot of findings. Hopefully not. Hopefully your product's very secure, but it doesn't always happen that way. Um, so to make things a little better, um, came out with re-import, um, and what it is really do, doing is kind of calculating the here and now view. You know, this is very important for developers because they want to figure out, okay, what, what are the things that need to be fixed right now? Um, and so what re-import does is it intellig intelligently uh, differentiates vulnerabilities from run report to another. So for example, and your scan report in January, you may have five vulnerabilities and the developer will fix two. 
And then when you import the scans again in February, Defect Ocean will automatically see, okay, I don't see these two, uh, these two findings that I saw last month. I'm going to go ahead and close the older ones and reflect on the record that these vulnerabilities were mitigated and they're fixed. So out of sight, out of mind. Um, in the contrast, the same happens if you have a, a regression or reintroduction. Um, it'll reopen those older vulnerabilities depending on if it sees a new one in a current report. So a lot of smart features around re-import, um, but you know, there, there's pros and cons to both. So getting into what, what re-import and import look like in, in your given Dojo instance, um, this is my, my demo for re-import functionality. Uh, looking at the top of the slide, we've got the import history functionality, and it kind of tracks everything that's happening during your re-import process. So on the very first import, uh, you've got four, four findings being created. Um, my developers had fixed two of the issues. So on the second import, it shows that two of my findings were closed. Um, and then things got a little sloppy on my third import. Those two issues that they fixed on the first go around have come back and brought with it another vulnerability. And so the, re the records reflect the same two reactivated findings, one initial, one new brand new finding. Um, and then at the bottom line, you see dang, we've got five findings now. Um, and then the pop-up on the right there shows, you know, this is the record on a, on a per finding basis of, you know, it was created, it was closed, it reactivated, we're doing the whole song and dance. Um, so there, there's a lot of audit locking in, in Defect Dojo to make sure that, you know, even though things may, may get fixed without your knowing, or maybe even regressed without you knowing, Defect Dojo will catch it, kind of alert you to it. So you're always sort of in the know. Um, and in terms of, of import, I don't have a slide identifying exactly what it looks like, but it's pretty much the same, just without all the smart features. Um, so you're probably thinking, okay, if I've got a, a smart option and a dumb option, why would I ever choose the dumb one, right? Um, but there's definitely a good use case for import, aka the dumb one. Um, and it's all about really identifying your audience and who you're collecting this data for. So in the case of your developers, you want to use re-import, keep the keep their queue of things that need to be fixed as small as possible. Your developers will like you for that. Um, but your auditors and compliance and standards people are not going to like that as much because using a re-import over and over does not really give you a good, uh, a good representation of a point in time scanning. You know, if, if you look in the UI, you're going to see one test and that test could have been used for years. But at first glance, without like really digging into it and getting into the import history and seeing exactly what's happening, your compliance people are going to ding you for that pretty hard sometimes. Um, so that's where import really comes into play is that it shows you exactly what's happening at every time you scan. So if you are regulated to have monthly pen test reports, it'll show as a new test in January, February, March, April, and it'll show new line items for each of those. So it'll be very easy for your compliance team to look at it and see, okay, they're good, we're moving on. Um, so in, in my experience, I like doing the best of both worlds approach. You know, if, if you're not really constrained by database uh, space, have them both, you know, have it import the exact same files twice every time they're available, one using import, one using re-import, both for totally two different audiences, but you kind of get the best of both worlds. Um, in addition to that, though, you know, it's, it's very important to know the limitations of your security team. If they can't keep up with triaging all those things, then your developers might get a little cranky with you that, you know, they're getting stale information or maybe uh, the security team isn't catching false positives in time. It's, it's, it's a big balance game. Um, so moving on to the duplication, what, what is it? Kind of gather a little bit from the name, the dupe. Um, well, maybe not. But anyways, what the deal is, is each time you import the scan report, it's going to take all of the results from the scan and then differentiate them in the database to figure out, you know, is this something we've seen before? Do I need to care about this? Can it be disregarded? And towards the end, uh, whenever you get your successful status code back that the import was successful, you'll have a much shorter list of vulnerability data that you only need to consider. And so the duplication will go through and mark all the ones that were previously in the scan report that have been seen before as duplicates. And depending on your configuration, they can either be deleted right out of the box or they can show up as having this little duplicate flag and status um, to where they won't appear in your filters and reports, which is pretty nice. Um, so, you know, how, how is that happening on the back end? So there's four different algorithms for how to identify these duplicates. Um, the one that's uh, 
kind of uses the default of what we refer to as the legacy one. This is the original uh, original algorithm with some tweaks. It relies on the findings title, CWE, line number and file path if it's applicable, and the description. Um, so you're probably thinking, you know, if I'm not using a line number and file path and like a static analysis tool, really only left with three fields here. And we realized, okay, yeah, maybe that's not so great. That can get really strict and not find duplicates very often. So we added in functionality to have um, the hash code calculated on a per parser break basis. So you can really start to identify what tools really excel in providing information into what fields. And then you can start tweaking your tools to get the most out of them. Because the, the overall goal is to reduce the amount of findings that need to be triaged at the end of the day. Um, so configuring these tools, um, I have a slide on this next about what this configuration looks like, but configuring each of the scanners to have the right fields is kind of the end game in Defect Dojo. It's gonna be your never ending battle of tweaking and getting your performance up to par. Um, so in case the hash code, uh, it is great, but it's not perfect. Um, so we introduced the idea of a unique tool ID. So some scanners have sort of their own glossary of vulnerability data, like a database or something like that. Um, examples of such are Center Cube, uh, Qualys Web App, Checkmarks. Some of those have their own uh, sort of like in a hash code. Usually it's like a five to six digit number um, that maps to the details of a given vulnerability. And so that is the, that's the golden standard for identi identifying duplicates because if say you import a, two Center Cube uh, scan reports and two findings have the same tool ID, there's no, no confusion there's duplicates there, you know, it's just, it's a one off and done. Um, but that's not really useful if uh, maybe you're trying to compare two tools and one has a unique tool ID and the other one doesn't. Um, and so in response to that, we added this kind of apples or oranges type of um, algorithm that takes the combo of the two. So for example, if uh, if you're using Cinecube in my previous statement that has a unique tool ID and something that doesn't, uh, such as Anchor Engine, then Sonar Cube will not use the unique tool ID. It will instead use the hash code because that's what Anchor is using. So instead of trying to compare apples to oranges, it'll just say, well, I've got apples and oranges. Let's go with what you have. And it'll try to figure it out the best it can. Um, so this is kind of what the configuration looks like in Dojo settings file. The settings file is very large, lots of places to configure. Um, and you can add in as many scans as you want here. I think out of the box, there's maybe 35, 40 different scans. Um, so not all 150 are supported. And that's mainly because you know, we don't have the best test data for every single tool or a tool could change its report uh, format and we don't have the updated, uh, updated test data to reflect that in our parsers and deduplication configurations. Um, but there's a large list right below this dictionary that shows all the fields that can be uh, can be used for hash code uh, deduplication algorithms. Um, and you can add in as many or little as you want. Um, so looking looking at this list, cargo audit looks like a long one. I think there's five different uh, five different fields there. So when going and comparing cargo audit scan to cargo audit scan, there's going to be pretty hard not to find a du or excuse me, pretty hard to find a duplicate because there's so many different fields added to the criteria. But then if you take something like the cloud exploit scan, it's only looking at title and description. Chances are it's going to have a much easier time finding a, a duplicate than cargo audit would. So it's really important to, to really tweak your tools and figure out, you know, what, what is the good balance to either never finding duplicates or finding too many, because both are kind of a big problem. So in terms of how deduplication is handled within import and re-import, it's, it's a little dicey. Um, and that's mainly because re-import is intended to catch as many uh, as many old findings as possible. And so uh, it relies on the deduplication algorithms, whether you have deduplication enabled or not. So if you're going through and say you're using a tool that doesn't have a duplication algorithm, it'll just rely on the severity and the title of the finding to figure out, you know, is this something I've seen before? And this isn't necessarily an issue because Reimport only works across um, the same consistent scan type each time. So, for example, you can't uh, reimport a perp scan over a center type scan, it just doesn't work. Um, so, this is, it actually works really well. Um, but you may have differing results if you try to use um, 
import with the same same kind of functionality because it only uses the hash code. It doesn't care what uh, duplication algorithm is used um, for a given scan type at all. It's only going to look at the hash code. So the closed hole findings feature is it can be a little unpredictable between each uh, each type of import. So definitely something to just watch out for. Um, so moving into a little easier topic, duplication is kind of mind boggling. There's a lot of documentation on it. I implore you to read it. Um, the tags, you know, what are they and why do we have them? Um, so they're basically just labels and just free flow metadata that you can add to pretty much any object in Defect Dojo. They started out in findings and uh, we realized like, oh my gosh, these are so great. You know, they can be used to, to filter things and search for things easier and they can be taken away. You can add as many as you want and they're just awesome. Um, so at the top, I've got them on findings. You know, you can add any kind of format you want, um, any way that really makes sense in your org really. Um, and in the middle, I've got them on the engagement and then at the bottom, even on a product. I, I don't have many, many use cases for tags on product, but functionality is there. Um, so this is kind of like a, a rendition of a custom field. So there's not a lot of extra custom fields uh, on any of the objects within Dojo, with the exception of, of a product, um, mainly because it's uh, in early Django days, it was very difficult to have kind of free flow database models. And so it's, it's a lot easier now and easily accomplishable, but tags are kind of the, the hackish way around that issue. Um, so they're everywhere because of that, but they add a lot of uh, granularity. So we also have something called services, which is basically the same thing as a tag, um, but it's way more official looking. You know, like you get your own little window on the finding pane. It looks very nice. Um, and it's it doesn't show up in the UI as visible because it's kind of like an internal uh, identifier. So why, why did we choose to use services over tags? Uh, what we found is that a lot of users were saying that uh, the Defect Dojo model doesn't really work as well on modern applications. Defect Dojo is, uh, it was created, I believe, in 2013. So in that time period, uh, web applications and just applications in general were just these big monoliths of code. It was just a massive thing. And nowadays, it seems everything is built on microservices or built of a bunch of smaller components kind of mushed together to create one big application. And the Dojo model doesn't really fit that that well. So we're working through changes to figure out, you know, what's the best way we can to really implement this to make it as future proof as we can. Um, and so what the service is for is really the first step in figuring out what's going to work the best. So we're, we're kind of doing the whole, you know, feed a little line out, figure out if there's a tug. If it is, give a lot more line type of thing. Um, so a couple of ways that services can be added. Um, they can be added at import time. So for example, if you're, you're scanning an application that you know is a microservice, then you can just add in the title of, of whatever service it is at import time, and it'll apply it to all the findings that are in the scan report. Or you know, if you forget to do that, you can go one by one and add the service, uh, whatever the service label is to a given finding. Okay, so gone through all the features. Let's talk about permissions. So when I think about permissions in Defect Dojo, I have two, two different extremes in my mind, either having only security people or security and developers. There's a pretty large difference between the two. Um, back in the day, this was very difficult to maintain because we had something called products authorized users, and you're basically just putting users onto a given product, and that was it. Um, so one of the, the massive improvements in Defect Dojo over the last year, year and a half is a totally different permission model. It's very modern. It's got different roles for things. It's, it's a terrific improvement. Um, so on the right here, I've got a, a very small snippet of two different uh, object lo permission levels um, across the five different roles. Um, so you see something like a finding, maintainer and owner are kind of on par with each other. They're basically identical. Um, and that's mainly because the, the maintainer is intended to be like a security person. Um, they need to have a lot of power in a lot of different areas, but they don't need to be able to, you know, add people to a given product uh, as a member of an organization or anything like that to where they can start making changes themselves or just straight up deleting a product because that has a lot of implications of deleting everything as well. Um, so part of figuring out which, which extreme you want to use is 
kind of difficult because you need to have a very good understanding of what each of these roles do and figuring out the, the best roles to give to your users. You, know, you only have really four to choose from. API importer is not for humans. Um, so breaking them down a little bit, looking at security only, um, there's no developers in here. It, it's basically just another security tool, but has kind of a central hub for all your other security tools. So it's kind of like a bridge. Um, but because of this, you know, the access control is kind of thrown out the window. You know, if everyone is going to be a security member, everyone's going to be a maintainer, basically. Um, so the permission model is, it's great, but it's not very useful here. Um, it can be used, though, in the case where if you have like interns coming in or maybe some auditors that need read permission, you can still hand those out and it works really well. Um, and then on the flip side of that coin, having developers and security kind of intermingle in the same tool um, kind of introduces the, the idea of like a company wide tool and access control is relied on very heavily. You know, you don't want to have uh, one developer team seeing vulnerability data of another developer team. You know, maybe they'll get a little self conscious or something, or that could be a violation of like a need to know basis or a circle of trust. Both are bad. Um, so it's really important to kind of set up guardrails around what each development team can see. Um, but to do this, like I mentioned previously, you need to have a really good understanding of what all the permission roles do so that you don't accidentally give a team too much power. Um, so doing more of a deep dive into the pros and cons of each, um, using it as, as, uh, as a security only team has some, some really good benefits at the very beginning of using Defect Dojo because we don't really have to tell as many people how to use Defect Dojo. You know, it, it's a very small net to throw over your security team and, you know, just kind of instruct them. You can do it in a Zoom meeting type of thing. Um, and you have a, a much smaller chance of any of them doing anything uh, nefarious, mainly because of there's likely not going to be any contractors used on your security team, but you may have a lot of contractors on your dev team. Um, but because of the significant, uh, significant difference in user base, having all developers and no developers, it's probably going to mean a leaner instance, which is probably going to be reduced costs for you, which who doesn't love that. Um, but you know, if you're using a security only tool, you kind of have to use the Jira integration to push things onto uh, into developers queues into Jira. I listed this as a con because, you know, what if your organization doesn't use Jira? Maybe they use Azure DevOps or ServiceNow or anything like that. You're kind of dead in the water. Um, so definitely a decision to think about before picking an extreme. Um, and then getting into the security developer mix, pros and cons. Um, getting developers involved with Defect Dojo generally increases the security presence in their minds overall, which is always positive. Um, but you, you do get more of a, a single source of truth. Um, so if developers are modifying issues within Defect Dojo, there's no communication break between, say, Jira and Defect Dojo or Slack and Defect Dojo or anything like that. Uh, so the more people that are actually using Defect Dojo, the chances are higher that some of them will go join our Slack channel or start contributing, um, but generally equals more community growth, which is really cool. Um, some of the cons could be, you know, you have to be very careful with your, your access control. If you misconfigure something, it could be dangerous or, you know, catastrophe, whichever. Um, and I mentioned earlier about the contractors, so I'll skip it for now. Um, as with everything in security, it's all about balance. You know, um, my uh, professional recommendation is to kind of do a hybrid model. You know, you start off small and keep it security centered at first and then start onboarding developers kind of slow. Um, I like to call some of those folks AppSec ambassadors, you know, developers that are really in touch with security and have a good idea of what they're doing. You can get them in the Defect Dojo and kind of get them really familiar with things so they can take their information back to their developer teams and kind of spread the, spread the, the knowledge wealth. Um, but as you're growing, you know, familiarity is, is very important. If you're just kind of going from zero to 100, probably not going to do things as correctly as you could. Um, so it, it's all about really figuring out what's best for the organization. Uh, next on the list, we've got Jira integration, which I touched on earlier, and then our API, some of the cool features that we have. Uh, apologies ahead of time, I'm running short on time, so I'm going to kind of blitz through a little bit. Uh, with our Jira integration, uh, it's it's bi-directional in some actions. Um, those actions include setting status on the Jira boards or in Defect Dojo. So for example, if you mark something in Defect Dojo as mitigated or inactive, it'll carry on to the Jira ticket, close it, and it works the same way backwards. Um, and the other one that we offer for bi-directionality is comments. So in Defect Dojo, we have a notion of notes, which is basically just a Jira comment. 
Um, and so when you drop a note in Defect Dojo, it'll be copied onto the JIRA ticket, vice versa. So this is uh, kind of what it looks like in the Defect Dojo side. Nothing changes much except you get that little JIRA, uh, I guess, stanza on, on the center left area showing whatever the JIRA issue is. Um, and on the JIRA side, it's basically taking all of the fields within the finding model and projecting them into the description box of the JIRA issue. And you get some other labels uh, and severity matches and things like that. Um, so you get a pretty close one-to-one -one representation. Um, in terms of really how to organize your, uh, your JIRA integration, chances are uh, your deployment of Defect Dojo is much younger than your organization's deployment of JIRA. So you're probably going to be forced to um, organize your dojo with whatever's happening in JIRA. Um, so in response to that, we have two different places where you can map uh, a Defect Dojo uh, model object to a JIRA project. Those are the products and the engagement. Uh, the project, uh, project to product mapping was the only thing that we offered a couple of years ago until we realized like, oh geez, maybe this, this isn't as flexible as we hoped. Um, and so now you can kind of override the product's JIRA configuration on a per engagement level. So this is great for things like sprints uh, and epics and things like that. Um, but generally speaking, you know, the Defect Dojo product should map to the JIRA project, but you know, another instance of components and services kind of breaks that rule. Um, really important thing to touch on with the JIRA integration is knowing when to push. There's three different, uh, I guess, places you could push, either set at the Defect Dojo product JIRA integration, you could set it to push all findings to JIRA that are in the product. Very dangerous, can't, can't say steer away any, anymore. It's, it's a horrible idea. Your developers will certainly hate you for it. Um, middle ground, kind of pushing all of the issues at a given scan time. Um, so say you've got a, a burp report and you want you know all of them are valid. You've probably tested them within the burp uh, kind of platform before generating the report. So you could push all of those into Jira. This does assume you have a pretty high confidence level for your scanner. You know that it's not you know generating a bunch of duplicates or false positives or anything like that. Um, but what I recommend the most is just pushing things individually. You know this. After you get eyes from a security professional on the finding, you know, okay, this is totally valid, send it to the dev team, then you can push to JIRA, either on that individual finding, or you can kind of select a handful of them in like our bulk edit menu and then push those in, in sort of like a bucket of sorts. But it's definitely not all or nothing, you know, it's much better to be a little more granular. Um, so following up with this, API smart features. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that all of the features I'm talking about today do have API endpoints. Um, but the most important one is probably going to be import scan and re-import scan. Um, so I, I, in the past, I've had to create scripts that go through and identify the correct product I want to push to. And then from there, identify the right engagement. And integrating that into your pipeline is you know, fine, but that could increase your runtime significantly if you're pushing pretty frequently. Um, so in response to that, Defect Dojo now has kind of more human accessibility, such that if you just give the name of a product or an engagement in, uh, in your import scan payload, it'll automatically find the correct object and push it to the correct place. Um, so it's really, really nice. Um, so if, if you run into an example of maybe the products that you're specifying don't exist, Defect Dojo will automatically create them for you. Um, this is really great if you are, say, onboarding a new product that's never been scanned before. Um, and you don't have to you know, go in and create these products with the correct names and all of that in Defect Dojo beforehand. You can just onboard them and it should all just work. It's really, really handy. Um, one thing to watch out for is this could become a pain um, if you're using something like a timestamps in your title. You, know, you could be having a vulnerability push to weird places that you're not expecting. Um, and that could be because of, you know, maybe a long job queue, or maybe your, your runner server goes down for a period of time and they get actually ran hours later or something like that. Um, last API feature I have for you today is this notion of, of kind of these tabulated stats that come after every import. And what it does is after all of the import magic is done on a given scan report, it'll run through and say, you know, this, this is the counts of all the objects I found. You know, these are the active ones. These are the duplicates. These are the, the amount of false pauses I found. Um, and it's separated out into different severities. So if you're using some external um, 
metric tracking software like Tableau or something like that, you can push all of these up and then uh, uh, any of the, the scripts on the back end of, of Tableau will take care of it for you. Um, so this is really great for identifying, you know, maybe where your tools are a little too noisy, or maybe they're they're not great at um, uh, filtering out any of the false positives or duplicates or anything like that. Um, so there's a lot of very not uh, valuable knowledge that can be used from these metrics. Okay, so let's go over the resources real quick. Oh no, I'm not sure what happened. Um, this is our moderator team. Uh, up top, we've got the three creators, Matt Desaro, Greg Anderson, and Aaron Weaver. They've been with the project since day one, really, and Matt and Greg are still very active today. Um, on the bottom four, we've got Dubrovko, Yannick, Damian, and Stefan. They've each brought so many great and unique things to, to the development team and for maintaining. Dubrovko and Yannick are the two Kubernetes aficionados that I mentioned earlier. They do a terrific job of helping um, helping contributors get their pull requests across the line when they were uh, result with Helm changes, um, but they're also well-versed in a lot of other places as well. Um, Damien was very responsible in kind of cleaning up all of our parsers and unifying them into a centralized format and making the import process significantly faster and catches a lot more errors. Terrific job there. Um, and then Stefan completely redid our permission model. So he took us from our kind of uh, scrappy authorized product model and brought us to a very modern RBAC system. Very cool. Um, if you're looking to get involved, uh, I've got a QR code that links to our contributing markdown file in the root of the repo. Um, what we love to see is when users either submit issues or feature requests directly in GitHub so that we'll see them faster. Um, what we love even more is when they actually just make the bug fixes or do the feature requests and submit a pull request for them. Um, this really gets, uh, gets eyes on it a lot faster because we tend to look at pull requests first because these are kind of the, the hot plates in the oven type of uh, situation. Um, but for example, if you want to get really involved in, in the Defect Dojo community, um, just start reviewing pull requests. This is how I got started out. I took an interest in, in college with Defect Dojo and I just really wanted to be involved and I started reviewing pull requests and the, uh, Greg and Matt noticed and they were like, hey, I want you to be a moderator. So that's actually how uh, Yannick, Dubrovko, Damien, and Stefan all got into uh, the moderators since they just really dug in deep and just started helping the community. And we see that. Um, for the ways to get involved, we got a couple different Slack channels. Um, the green one is just our general Defect Dojo channel where you can ask all sorts of questions, ask for help, ask for recommendations, or even provide suggestions and input to those that are uh, asking the questions. It, it's a very fluid channel where everyone just kind of helps in one another. Um, but if you are actually developing, we have a development channel specific for just those purposes, such that the, the moderator team is a little more active there to help pull requests get across the line a little quicker. Um, so that's probably the best place if you're looking for Django or Python help. Um, and then on the far right in the blue QR code, we've got the documentation. Um, I keep that bookmarked. You know, I know Defect Dojo pretty well, but it's never going to leave my bookmark bar. It's, it's too valuable. You know, Defect Dojo has a really good documentation suite. Highly recommend you check it out. Um, got some social media here, Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, those are mainly for notifying uh, subscribers to Defect Dojo updates. Uh, each time we do an update, we have uh, automation that goes through and submits tweets or you know, I don't think LinkedIn has a, a cool way of saying posts, but those things. Um, so go ahead and follow or like, subscribe, whatever they call them in those respective platforms. Uh, and then finally, some quick free takeaways, or excuse me, some takeaways. Uh, Defect Dojo is totally free. Um, it's a risk free forever trial, you know, we're never going to block your access or take it away. We technically can't. Um, so, you know, getting involved is a no cost to you. All it costs is your time really, which is not too bad for a security tool. Um, community is super involved. You know, everybody loves to help one another, especially in the Slack channels. Um, love to pay it forward and take advantage of it. You know, it, it's, it's very harmonious there. Um, you have very quick release cycles. So if you find something that maybe you, you think could need a little bit more love or maybe something that's broken, please go ahead and just fix it. You know, it'll be out in a month and your work will benefit from it. It's really neat. Um, we have new, new features and contributors, uh, more features often than contributors. Contributors stick around for a while, but new features are, they come out very quickly. Um, 
largely in response to our fast release cycles. Um, the best thing about Defect Dojo is it really increases the security presence uh, and increases productivity within your org. You know, you see it just talking about Defect Dojo, people think, you know, what is that? That's a really cool name. And then they start to learn a little bit about security and how it's kind of everywhere. It really needs to be everywhere. Um, and then lastly, Defect Dojo is a really good place to get involved in the open source world. If you're just trying to hone your developer skills or maybe you don't get to do a lot of developing at your security job, this is a great place to kind of live out the developer fever dream. Um, it's really great. So getting involved, uh, not only is it good for your brain, but it's good for the community too. Um, okay, that's, that's all I got for you. Thank you so much. Um, thanks. Great stuff, Cody. Great talk. Got a few questions, if you don't mind? Yeah, totally. Okay, so we've got a question about, actually going back to you, the import and re-import towards the beginning of your talk, uh, and an interesting question here around uh, the differences between the two, perhaps a bit of clarification required around um, uh, closing findings and whether you can do them in, in, in both, whether you can do them both re-import and import. Do you want to just clarify Clarify that for us. Yeah, I, I got a little a choppy around that area. Um, but the closed loop finding feature is available in both both endpoints. Um, so that's actually the magic behind the re-import uh, functionality is the closed loop findings is what does the differentiating and does the closing. Um, so when you go to re-import, it's actually enabled by default. Um, but the same functionality is also present in import. It's just disabled by default. You just have to go in and click a little box that says you want to do it. Um, but, you know, as, as I touched on, it is a little dicey between the two, just based on what your configurations are. So definitely watch out for that, because it's bit me in the past, probably others too. Okay, great. So um, you talked about tags earlier on. Um, and I wonder whether tags can be used to notify perhaps product owners, security teams, developers, when things are updated, new findings. Can you, does it have that level of granularity, perhaps, or usability? Ooh. You know, I, I don't believe so. Um, but because Defect Dojo has got such a great API, you could probably query that and just have a listener somewhere that's just running on the same ser server as Dojo and query all the tags and say, you know, look at the objects with this tag. And if it's present, send out a notification to your platform of choosing, you know, whether it's um, maybe a tag for saying this finding's been viewed with eyes, or maybe it's a, a risk acceptance or whatever the, the case may be, whatever your usage, usage is, um, you could have listeners outside of Dojo that can handle that for you, uh, but it is not out of the box. Okay. Can you also, could Defect Dojo also track remediation activities as well to, um, yeah, to see how, how applications are being, being fixed through it throughout, throughout its life cycle? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we talk about, I guess, remediation. Uh, mitigation to me usually means it's like completely fixed, but remediation could be either fixed or maybe risk accepted. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Defect Dojo has a really strong risk acceptance suite. Um, it, it's got a whole bunch of information that you can kind of dump into it, such as like who approved it, let's see a document with signatures on it, or the reasoning for making it a risk acceptance. Um, and so all of that is, is tracked very blatantly in Defect Dojo if you choose to use it. Um, but in terms of actually doing the mitigation, that is the status on all the findings. So you know whether something is mitigated uh, implicitly through re-import, where it just kind of figures it out for you, or you go in and mark it by yourself and say, you know, this is mitigated. Uh, it'll show up in the metrics and reports and within the UI saying such that you know this finding is mitigated. You don't have to worry about it anymore. Yeah, great stuff. Yeah, it's a key difference there between the two. Um, many organizations, many people watching this will have similar tools, perhaps for their, for their own tools, whether that's a, the dashboard of check marks or a, a SAS tool or, or, or whatever. Do you see Defect Dojo as, as literally replacing those, those dashboards as being a single pane of glass or can they, or is it complementary? Uh, you know, how do you, how do you see them cohabiting? Uh, it's intended to be kind of a single pane of glass where you just kind of have everything feed into Defect Dojo. Um, but there are examples of kind of using both in parity. Um, so there's actually three scanners that have uh, an API driven integration such that you're not just downloading a report and pushing it into Dojo, but it reaches out to the tools APIs and pulls directly. 
Um, those are Center Cube, Cobalt IO, and I believe Edge Scan. Um, but they they kind of have the the two different system kind of vibe to them. You know, Center Cube has a lot of really good information within within their platform and setting up different uh, quality rules and something about gates, memory servers. I haven't used Center Cube in a couple of years, um, but all the great things within Center Cube can't be reflected within Defect Dojo that well. Um, and so it is kind of important to have a double platform, but you know, it's only happened on three, three different security tools out of 150. So the general trend is want to have everything unified in Defect Dojo, but there are some exceptions. Okay, and you touched on this towards the end of your talk about the the um, the maintenance cycle, release cycles. Just confirm again how often, because you know people often think about open source projects. How often has it been supported? The maintenance can be a key concern. So you just want to reiterate, you know, how often um, Defect Dojo is updated, uh, new releases, for example. Yeah, um, so releases are the first Tuesday of every month. Um, so, you know, for the month of June, for example, we didn't release until June 7th. So it really just depends on when the days fall. So for example, if July, maybe the July 1st is a Tuesday, you know, that's a release cycle of what's that, like 24 days, very short, but it could be as long as like 36 days too. It really just depends on when the two different Tuesdays fall. Um, but on average, it's right at about a month. Um, so very quick. Great stuff. Okay, just checking if we have any more questions coming in. Um, not at the moment. Let me just double check. I think we seem to have, uh, we're coming up towards the top of the hour anyway, Cody, but I think we, we're all out of questions. So perhaps it's just uh, just my job now to, to thank you once again for your talk. Um, Oh, there's a question come in very quickly. Last last one, perhaps. Um, what is the most unique use you've seen for Do Defect Dojo? Perhaps a bit of a curveball there for you. Ooh, uh, I think the most unique use that I've seen is where an org had a lot of microservices. And this is kind of what prompted the whole microservices kind of, not necessarily a migration, but a real thought exercise of how do we solve this problem? Um, but what, what this team ended up doing was they had products, um, it didn't re necessarily represent anything really. It was an, a, a full application, but there were so many components that made up that the engagement kind of became a pseudo product. And so the engagement became a specific endpoint that they were testing. Um, and so generally that's more of a product thing, but they pushed it down to engagements. And so then they had a whole bunch of different tests in different places, and it, it pretty much slid the entire model down a step. And then they relied on tags very heavily for filling out all of the metadata that they needed on a given finding or an endpoint. It was really creative how they, they had this issue and just took a, a way to solve it with the, the Defect Dojo model because it is sort of rigid. Um, but yeah, I was really impressed by them. Excellent. And also shows the, the power of the tags as well as part of that. Yeah, it's all about creativity, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Great stuff. Well, I think that probably is uh, the last one that we've got time for today. So yes, once again, Cody, thanks again for your time. Thanks again for your presentation. Uh, thanks everyone for, for viewing this video. And uh, if you're interested, we now have the, the keynote over at the keynote stage talking about OWASP top 10 and whether cloud has made any difference over the last 15 years. So I'll encourage you to take a look at that. Thanks again, everyone.